Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Lee. I am the Director of Community Impact for the Chicago Community Trust. Um, and I have the esteemed pleasure of welcoming you all to this event. Uh, the Chicago Community Trust is co-hosting this important conversation um, during this unprecedented time. Um, and uh, we think that um, engaging all of you uh, to listen intentionally about um, what immigrant communities uh, need right now. Um, and as we think about policy to move forward, um, we're just delighted to have all of you. Um, just to give a little bit of background for those who are not familiar, the Chicago Community Trust is over 100 years old. We are the um, community foundation for the Metro Chicago um, area. And we are um, known as funders. We work with uh, um, donors and also with um, philanthropic institutions um, to ensure that the Chicago region is a thriving, equitable, and connected region. Um, and we are, are lucky to have our CEO, Dr. Helene Gale, um, be a board member uh, of New America and to foster this important collaboration. Um, I also want to mention that since Dr. Gale has been at the Trust, we have been focusing our work on closing the racial wealth gap. We recognize that it is the racial and ethnic wealth gap that um, has created so many of the issues that so many of us are addressing in our work um, day to day. And that's been especially pronounced uh, during uh, this pandemic. Um, COVID-19 has impacted all of us. Uh, but we recognize that there are communities in Chicago and across the nation uh, that are disproportionately impacted because of um, because of barriers and systemic um, racism. And um, so we're just um, excited to have this conversation to, to think about what those policy solutions might be. Um, and with that, I will, oh, and I also want to mention that uh, the Chicago Community Trust has also been um, the place where we hold the um, Illinois Immigration Funders Collaborative, which we are delighted to be um, a part of. And I believe um, several of my colleagues on the Funder Collaborative are on this call. Um, and we were created in 2012 uh, to address, um, to, for the funders to, to uh, convene and uh, respond to the issues surrounding DACA. Um, and since then, we've continued to um, um, be a collaborative, uh, responding to various issues impacting our immigrant population. Um, so just delighted for all of us to be part of this call too. So with that, I'm gonna pass the phone or uh, the call to Megan uh, Dugan-Bassett, who is a fellow at um, New America in Chicago. Thank you, Anna. Um, I get the I have the pleasure of working with Anna in the office. So um, as a New America Fellow, I'm actually based at the Chicago Community Trust, which has been really wonderful and delightful to work with all the amazing people there. Um, welcome to all of you. For those who are not familiar with New America, we are a think and do tank based in DC. I am part of New America Local, um, which has four hubs around the country um, that are doing work with um, local communities on issues of work, income, um, and equity. Um, and I'm really excited to be part of this discussion. Um, the idea for this um, event, one of the things we really wanted to make sure, um, I am not someone who has worked a lot on immigration policy, and so this is a new topic to me. But um, there's such a robust um, and large population of immigrants in, and refugees in Chicago. We really wanted to make sure to have an open conversation and be able to talk about um, what are the experiences of those uh, communities over the last four years as immigration policy has really changed quite a bit. Um, but also as current events are unfolding, how has COVID-19 impacted those communities differently? And really our goal for this conversation is to um, both um, help people who aren't as familiar with these populations who would like to learn more about um, how these current events are playing out for those communities and how they can serve them better, but also for those of you who are very familiar with immigration policy and with changes um, in the community um, for um, you to um, be able to also share what you know um, and hopefully um, learn more as we um, really have a dialogue. We're going to um, actually first, we wanted to do a little bit of listening. Um, so um, we wanted to spend some time just hearing from um, people in the community um, about um, how, how things are going from immigrant and refugee communities right now. Um, one thing I'm gonna ask um, is if people can um, actually use the chat 
we wanted to take a really informal poll. So um, we just wanted to hear from people that are joining. Um, what is your interest um, in being on this call? What would you like to learn from this call? And if you want to say a little bit about, um, you know, how, um, uh, what your connection is to the immigrant and refugee communities um, in Chicago, you certainly can. So for example, if you're already working with those communities, if you are a member of that community because you are an immigrant or a refugee yourself, or you have family members who are, um, feel free to drop a little note in the chat and we'll just keep those going um, as we um, start to um, share. Um, but right now I'm gonna actually turn it over to um, Nissa Ree, who we're really happy to have with us. She is the CEO of Borderless Magazine, and she's going to um, take over this listening section. Thank you, Megan. So uh, I think to start off, we have a little uh, presentation from StoryCorps, which is, of course, a national organization, but has a, a location here in Chicago at the Cultural Center. And it's a it's the story of a young couple uh, living in Chicago and their their challenges at this time. Picon was just two years old when his parents brought him to the United States from Mexico on a tourist visa. They never left. In 2012, Irakere received DACA and was able to attend law school. It was around that time that he met Ariana Hermosillo. He later asked her on a date to Millennium Park in Chicago. And it was there that Irakere told her he was undocumented. Did it make you feel apprehensive about dating me? No, it, it didn't make me apprehensive. It was almost like, it's okay, it's cool, but not even fully grasping what that meant. I was a U.S. born citizen, and I think I didn't realize that I would start living some of that indirectly through spending time with you. So I've started working as an immigration attorney. It's weird to be undocumented. It's weird to be in those offices with somebody else who also is in the same situation. You've mentioned to me uh, that sometimes you're scared or you're sort of nervous when I go to immigration court or when I go to ICE. Because I imagine you going in there and talking smack and just kind of standing up for your clients. And I just imagine you saying the wrong thing. <laughs> Tell me the truth. Have you ever been afraid? I'm, I'm always afraid. <laughs> um, when I went to my first ICE check-in with a client, it's on the fourth floor and it's just completely packed to the brim and you cannot walk around. It's very hot. It's almost suffocating. Sometimes I'm curious if they know about my status. Yeah. And we've kind of built an unspoken system for you telling me in the morning that you will be at a nice check-in. And then I say, please be careful. And then you text me when you're out and safe. And I say, thank God. But it does weigh me down a little bit. It is a very specific cloud hanging over us. It just feels like we're at pause. Travel plans are paused. Long-term plans are paused. You know, we, we want to buy a house. We really can't take too many steps in any direction until we have this resolved. So it is hard. What did our wedding day feel like for you? Um, I think I, I felt that peace. Yeah, like it's a, it's it's the start of something new for us. We've been together for over five years now. You've been very supportive and very caring in so many ways. I wonder how you'll feel when you no longer have that title of undocumented person, but I'll be there with you. So I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Ire Kere Picon and Ariana Hermosillo. Although the two were married earlier this year, it is still unclear whether Ira Kere will receive a green card to become a permanent resident. That was a really sweet story, I think. Uh, but of course we know you know, immigrants in Chicago and elsewhere are a really diverse group of people from all different countries and all different um, backgrounds. And we have two people in the, the 
talk in the webinar today that I just want to bring into the conversation who are really uh, important people in their own communities. And um, Nancy, let's start with you from a United African Organization. Are you, are you able to unmute yourself there? Uh, let's see, where are you, Nancy? Uh, all right, I see you, Nancy, but you'll have to unmute yourself um, to talk. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello, Nancy. Hello, how are you? Good, uh, welcome. So, um, Nancy, do you wanna start just by telling a little what United African Organization is to everyone? Yes, my name is Nancy Esri-Fiotri and I am with United African Organization. We are a coalition of different African community-based associations here in Illinois and we work to promote social economic justice and civic participation to empower African immigrants and refugees mainly here in Illinois. Um, so most of our work um, revolve around public policy advocacy, organizing within the community and helping people with the support that they need to be able to access programs. Yeah. Nancy, you, you deal with a whole wide range of people from all different countries and all different age groups. What do you think people, what do you wish people understood about what it means to be an immigrant or refugee in Chicago today? What do you wish people knew? Great question. Um, when Megan reached out to me over the weekend, I was completely broken over the death of another community member. Um, for us as Africans, we are often caught in the intersectionality of being black, caught in the larger struggles of the black community, the struggles of the immigrant community, and for many constituents that are Muslim also caught up in the issues around um, xenophobia and other things as well. Um, FG was 53, a resident of the fourth ward, a family of four and spouse to a hair breeder. There were also a family of limited English speakers. They mainly spoke either Wolof or French at home. And they had a disabled child in their household. Um, I was really sad because Evgene was the main person who took care of their daughter. She needed dialysis three times a week. And as his wife braided hair, he was the one who took her up and down for their check-ins and the dialysis. Um, none of the resources for COVID-19 that have been provided by the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, is any African language at the moment. FG was a driver, his wife a hair braider, these families depend on their day-to-day -day sales, what they are able to bring in. The hair breeding business is really seasonal and it's around this time during tax season that they are able to make most of their sales and bring in income. Mm. Many of them, the drivers, the hair breeders have had to shelter at home for these past six weeks, six to eight weeks without any access to income. Um, for those who have social, right, they have been eligible for something through the case that probably the stimulus payment. But for many of our constituents that are self-employed, access to unemployment benefits is still a struggle. Um, it was only on April 15th that IDES asked everyone to apply for unemployment benefits. And they don't have any specific guidelines that help these unemployed populations, self-employed populations, to help them in understanding how the process is going to work. I currently understand that IDES is working on the system to help them implement um, payments to people who are self-employed. So no one has been able to gain anything yet. 
um, they are at home and trying to see how they can manage between now and when they'll be able to get back to work or when they are able to get any income. Um, we just had, um, for us, we had, we've had a number of constituent virtual meetings and we just had one this morning with close to 100 participants, many of them self-employed with all sorts of questions about how they are going to assess income or what they can do at this time. Um, most of what we have heard as well is that some of the people who have gotten sick are mostly people who are through self-employed, Uber drivers, mm -hmm. cab drivers, some of them have even passed away, just like FG, because of this coronavirus. Um, they also have children at home. Some of the parents that we've been in contact with we do not even know about checking the kids' work, whether they have access to the technology that they need or not and how to even access sleep to be able to help their children. The most desperate and the most desperate are our undocumented folks, um, not eligible for anything. People are desperate for food. Um, we have had a number of donors that have been generous to drop off food for some of our families. Um, many of those who applied for the Chicago Rental Assistance Program have not heard back or were not chosen. Mm. Um, many people are desperate for income resources to help them with their utility bills, their rent, and their food. Um, we have a lot of people who have items who are asking whether they can use that for unemployment. Some have had to stop and stay home because their children are also at home and they don't have anyone to take care of them. Um, I think that besides that, um, most people, right, um, what I fear the most are those people who are self-medicating at this time. Um, I lost a lot of mistrust in the health system or government system. We have I've had so many people tell me about the herbs they are taking, some taking chloroquine and other things just to protect themselves so that they don't have to find themselves in any health facility. They don't even want to get tested for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, those are some of the issues. Um, in addition to that, um, we've seen with immigration, many people are afraid, even those who can access these for their family members. We're getting a lot of questions about public charge and how this is going to impact them later on if they get unemployment benefits, um, food stamps, or um, anything um, that relates to the government. Um, and we also seen um, a number of Haitians that have been deported recently back um, to Haiti. Some of them even tested positive for coronavirus after they were deported. So those are some of the things that um, we're working around and trying to see how best that we can help people in their community. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Nancy. There's so much pain and confusion and fear. And I, I'm sure people have more questions for you about how to help. I can see that in the chat box, how to reach out to you. Um, so if you're able to stick around, please do. Um, I wanna also call on Fernando from uh, Spanish Public Media right now. Fernando, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, yes I am. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Great, Fernando, um, same question to you. You know, what do you wish people understood or about what it's like to be, to be an immigrant right now? What are you thinking people are getting wrong? Well, the first thing, so I'm a DACA recipient myself. I came to the, to the United States in 1986 when I was 12 years old. Um, even though I have DACA, I still, I still live in the shadows, right? Uh, and there's a lot of socioeconomical aspects that 
uh, that people sometimes get wrong. For example, just the fact that um, a person can stay home and work, that's a luxury immigrant families don't have. We cannot afford to stay home. We cannot afford to not go to work, right? Uh, we, and we often, a lot, of, um, for example, my stepdad, uh, and I even worked for, uh, had worked for a company that cleans, right? That does cleaning. So a lot of these jobs require interacting with large numbers of people. Uh, we clean essential businesses, work, we work in restaurants, grocery stores, we are making deliveries. So we cannot afford to not, <laughs> to not go to work and we cannot afford to work from home. Uh, right, so when they come, uh, when they say, "Oh, well, it's stay at home and you you're saving a life." Well, yeah, we might be saving a life, but we're also <laughs> not saving our lives, right? Um, and even as a DACA recipient, and there's uh, a lot of other people that I know who are also DACA recipients, this new public charge immigration rule that went into effect last um, late February. Uh, has left many many of us increasingly afraid to seek any public services, uh, from medical care to you know just so the fear of that could lead to deportation, or uh, prevent us from receiving a permanent residency in the future if there was something to happen in immigration. There's the fear that that might come back and haunt us, right? Um, even though there's a few people that ha that I know that have DACA and have applied for unemployment they still have that fear that that is gonna count against them. Um, and just as an example, uh, we need these services, right? Uh, I live in a building that has, in a small apartment, that has six other, six other different apartments with fa the, the smallest family is four. Uh, and we're asking this social distancing when <laughs> ourselves, we cannot even social distance. Right, and there's a lot of other families out there I, I, that are in a little village in Humboldt Park that live in this same situation with in a building where there's six, seven families, uh, that uh, average size of the families four, and they live in the small spaces, and we're asking them to social distance, and we're and they're going out to work, and they're coming back to work. So it is, it is, it, it's a luxury. Many of our immigrant families cannot cannot afford. And some of these policies, I mean, DACA and the public charge issue, like these are things that were going on before COVID and now they're just being exacerbated by the, the disease. Um, Megan, I wanna pass it on to you um, for the next section. Thank you so much, Fernando. Yep. Thank you, Fernando. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Um, we're gonna open it up to our panel discussion now. Um, so thank you guys for joining us and thank you so much to Nancy and uh, Fernando. Um, I wanna say, you know, anyone who has questions for the next section, please feel free to type those um, in the chat um, and continue to, to add in the chat. Um, you know, if there's specific things you're interested in hearing about um, throughout that we've got throughout this session, we've gotten some really interesting um, comments and people have mentioned like what, what their connection is in the community. So keep that up. So we're very lucky to have a really wonderful um, panel with us today. Um, so um, I'd like to welcome um, Karina Ayala Bermejo, um, a CEO and president of Instituto de Pro Progreso Latino. Um, we also have um, someone that I am super lucky to call my boss, um, Cecilia Munoz, the Vice President um, for Public Interest Technology and Local Initiatives at um, New America. Um, and many of you may know her. Um, she pre previously worked um, in Chicago um, years ago and has just been a, an amazing leader mm -hmm. on this issue um, over the years. Um, you've already met Nisari, Nisari the um, founder and uh, CEO of, uh, or Executive Director of Borderless Magazine. Um, welcome, Nissa. Thank you. Um, we're also joined today um, by Dr. Nicole St. John, um, and um, she specifically um, works um, with at the Kobler Center, um, working um, with people who have experienced refugees, in particular, who have experienced trauma um, at Heartland um, Alliance. Um, we're um, our final panelist is Fred Sow, who I've known for many years, um, and I'm sure many of you also have. Um, the Senior Policy Council at the Illinois Center for Immigrant and Refugee um, Rights. Um, 
thank you all for joining us. Um, we want to open it up and just talk a little bit. Um, let's give a little bit of background for people like me who are newer to this issue. We'll talk a little bit about how immigration policy has changed over the years. Um, and then we'll start to dig into um, you know, what we see coming down the pike, um, what you're hearing from communities. Um, but also, um, I want to make sure we really talk about you know, what are things that you're seeing solutions you're coming, seeing coming out of communities and what nonprofits and um, foundations um, are doing um, in this space. Um, so um, let's start it off. Um, I'd love to hear from um, Cecilia um, and Fred. Um, what are some of the key changes that you've seen in immigration policy over the last um, four or five years? So I'll I'll start, if that's okay with you, Fred. Um, this is Cecilia. Um, it's almost hard to know where to begin. There's been so much that has changed. Um, and I think if there is a, a thread which goes through kind of all of the policy changes, it really is the, 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 there's really two threads. One is that we have a federal administration which is really interested in stoking fear. And in um, Nancy and Fernando's presentations, you heard, the extent to which that's been really successful. And then the second, I'm sorry to say, is that this is a federal administration which is really interested in reducing the number of people who come to the United States from foreign countries. So that means both immigrants and refugees. Um, refugee resettlement has slowed to almost nothing. Um, and, you know, they just announced, you know, in the last week uh, that they want, don't intend to process green cards um, for 60 days, which is, it, I mean, their excuse is the current um, crisis, but that's a strategy which has actually nothing to do. It doesn't inf influence the crisis at all. Obviously, COVID-19 is something we have here in the United States. It's not coming from immigrants or green people who seek green cards. But to sort of put it in perspective, that story core piece that you heard, you know, Irekire is waiting for a green card by virtue of his wife's citizenship. So if you stall green cards, what you're preventing is, is his adjustment of status, right? Um, the, 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 I think the public frequently assumes that people who are waiting for green cards are just somebody who got in a line somewhere because they want to come to the United States. When in fact, the people that we're talking to are the members of our family, the people that we're talking about are the members of our families. So we've had in the past four or five years, a series of travel bans a dramatic decline in refugee processing, um, a dramatic increase in immigration enforcement, both at the border and at the interior, some you know, craziness and devastation at the US-Mexico border, um, which includes the policy of, of separating families uh, and increased detention, but also we've pretty much uh, ground asylum processing to, uh, to a near halt and have are preventing people from asking for asylum at the US-Mexico border. And there are now camps of people, of tens of thousands of people in Mexico who are have, were already exposed to violence as a result of our policy decisions, but are now also ex terribly exposed to the virus um, because of conditions that our policies in the United States created. And I know um, Fred's gonna talk a little bit about public charge and you already heard about it. Um, from Nancy and Fernando, um, uh, but that has had an enormous, enormous impact, which is I think what the administration intended on keeping people, including people who are eligible for the kinds of services which, you know, Congress has put forward, which are essential if people are going to keep keep it together. Um, the, that policy is preventing people, is discouraging people who are eligible for those services from taking advantage of those services, which means you know, a, a, a additional levels of pain and devastation, it particularly felt, harshly felt by immigrant communities. Um, the last thing I'll say before handing off to Fred is, um, is DACA, right? You heard again in the StoryCorps story um, about one DACA recipient, there are just uh, around 800,000 of them and we're waiting for a Supreme Court decision in the DACA case any day. Um, and, you know, it's impossible to predict exactly what they're going to do, but there's a lot of fear um, that that will get a negative decision and that the administration will take negative action also against DACA recipients. So all of that adds up to a climate of fear, which is being stoked intentionally by our government, um, and uh, a climate in which 
people who are immigrants and also people who are parts of immigrant communities, whether they are immigrants or not, right? We know that many, many, many immigrants live in mixed status families with that where there are citizens and immigrants, legal immigrants and undocumented immigrants all in the same household. Um, these, so the reach of these policies goes well beyond the you know, foreign born people themselves. Um, they can affect whole huge swaths of the community and it's part of what is making our communities more vulnerable um, to the impacts of this virus, to the impact of the economic turmoil which has followed. So it's, you know, I wish it were better news, but it's, it's not. And, um, you know, we will have uh, an enormous amount of work to do to fight back from, from all of these policy changes. Um, and, you know, it's important that we illustrate the harm that they're causing because it's, it's harm. I mean, obviously you heard from Nancy and Fernando how deep the pain is and how deep the fear is. Um, but that undercuts all of us, uh, not just the immigrant community. And with that, let me hand off to Fred. Hi, everyone. Um, first off, thanks for thanks for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, and thanks to everyone to, for taking part this afternoon. Uh, I'm not sure how much I can add to uh, Cecilia's very thorough uh, overview of uh, developments over the past several years. Um, I think the you know, if there is a bright side to all of this, um, I, I guess I would point out a couple. Um, first, up, you know, um, you know, first off, you know, um, I think people are realizing just how wrong these policies are, and they're now stepping up to fight back. Um, and you know, this isn't just um, you know people coming out to demonstrate or march uh, as we saw, you know, as we see regularly on May Day or uh, for the Families Belong Together March a couple of years back. But it's also um, many state governments and local governments, um, you know, trying to figure out, um, you know, for themselves or in alliances with each other, um, you know, the best ways to um, resist um, the, you know, this administration's policies. Um, we saw this very, very early on with the litigation challenging the, uh, the, the, uh, the Muslim travel ban, um, basically within the first week of this, this administration. And we continue to see this with uh, the ongoing litigation, the challenges to remain in Mexico or the, uh, the you know, the proclamation limiting people based on, based on, um, you know, help, um, whether they have health care coverage or the public charge litigation, which um, I'll may say a few words about later on. Um, and we are also seeing movement on the legislative front. Um, you know, uh, any number of states, uh, including here in Illinois, uh, have, you know, enacted legislation that, uh, you know, prior, to, you know, prior to this administration would have ha would would not have gained as much traction. Uh, now it has, um, whether it's uh, attempts to um, de-link local, pol local police and state police forces from immigration enforcement, or to extend uh, driving privileges uh, to the undocumented, or to uh, extend health care coverage. Um, you know, um, you know, all these all these different things are now coming to the fore. Um, you know, thanks and you know, thanks largely to uh, reaction to you know the overreach of this administration. Um, you know, I, one last thing I would note: um, yes, immigrant communities, uh, immigrant families are confused and scared. But you know, I, I do want to emphasize that uh, our communities are incredibly resilient as well. And uh, you know, they've you know, if anything, you know, many of them have shown some really deep inner strength, and you know, have stepped forward to try to support each other. Um, you know. I can think of several organizations that have pooled their resources um, to, you know, support their neighbors, um, support their community members, uh, particularly in light of the current pandemic. Um, so, you know, so, you know, you know, and, you know, and on top of that, and on top of the communities coming together, um, I think there have been many allies who've been willing to step up, um, you know, to support um, people who, you know, um, for whatever reason have been excluded from, from the federal relief. And I know we'll be talking about that a little bit later too. So, um, Fred, you know- can you share I, a little bit, sorry, can you share a little bit more about some of the efforts that you've seen where people have been coming together to help their neighbors? 
Sure, sure. Well, um, one example I can think of is uh, the Brighton Park Neighborhood Council, um, which has surveyed, um, you know, several dozen, you know, community members to figure out the needs that they have, um, and you know, and has created a, a mutual assistance fund um, to, you know, try to help those who are in need. Um, and I can think of several other organizations, um, you know, in, both here in the city as well as in the suburbs uh, that have launched similar funds. Um, I think that's just one example of the ways in which, um, you know, immigrant communities are, are coalescing um, to try to support each other in this time of need. Fred, Fred I understand that um, you have been part of the coalition in um, Chicago or Illinois that's been working on the public charge um, stuff. Can you say a little bit, explain a little bit more about what that means, how it's impacting people and what you guys are doing about it? Yeah, um, I, you know, for, thank you, Fernando, for bringing this up, and thank you, Cecilia, as well, for bringing this up. Um, the public charge rule has been something that this administration has had in its, um, in its, uh, you know, in its spotlight for several years now, and it finally was able to implement this new rule back in February. In fact, right, right, right when the pandemic was starting to hit. Um, you know, so, you know, this, this rule um, expands the range of public benefits that count toward what's considered public charge, which could disqualify someone for, from getting a green card or getting an immigrant visa. Um, and then also ex expands and quantifies the range of different considerations um, that um, Either, either Homeland Security or the State Department can use to determine whether someone is likely to become a public charge. So um, this, this is having two effects. Um, one, the more obvious one being sowing confusion among immigrant communities, um, you know, to the point, as Cecilia noted, that, and Fernando noted, that uh, many immigrants are just confused as to you know whether they should seek unemployment benefits, or whether they should um, whether they should enroll in Medicaid, or or seek um, seek medical treatment. Um, so, and that's and that's particularly and tragically playing out during this pandemic. But um, the other effect, um, which is probably even more serious, um, but getting less attention, is that it it essentially creates a wealth test uh, for um, you know for many immigrants who intend to come to the United States or to seek seek a green card. Um, now you have to show essentially show a minimum amount of income. Uh, you have to show a certain range of education or job experience. Uh, if you're too young or you're, you're too old, that's a strike against you. Um, so all these different things are, are now um, in, in effect, um, you know, you know, due, you know, due to this administration. Uh, my organization, ICRR, uh, was one of several organizations across the country that filed a lawsuit uh, to, uh, or filed lawsuits to challenge uh, the public charge um, regulation. Um, at the trial level for each of these lawsuits, we won. Um, but the Supreme, the the Justice Department, being particularly persistent, um, sought you know raised raised appeals that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and uh, the Supreme Court agreed to set aside every single um, injunction that we had won at the trial court level, uh, thereby allowing the um, public charge to go into effect. And uh, you know, the last domino to fall was actually the, uh, the, the court order that we'd won in Illinois, which was an Illinois only order as opposed to all the others which were national. So yeah, since February 24th, public charge is now in effect thanks to adverse Supreme Court rulings. I wanna ask a kind of an, unusual question. Um, and then I want to make sure we get we um, chat more with Nicole, Nissa and Karina. Um, I think one of the things I hear in this conversation sometimes is you'll hear people say, well, my ancestors came here legally, or my ancestors, you know, followed all the rules. And I'm just curious. Um, I feel like for many of us, we don't necessarily have a real clear sense of how those ex like those rules for what it what you know, who's allowed to come in and how that has changed, and I'm just curious if you have anything, like if you had someone in your family say that to you, or you know, someone you met say that to you, how would you respond to that? How have expectations and rules for 
um, immigrants, refugees really changed drastically over, you know, the last many, many years. So do you want that one or I've been doing a lot of talking, so. Well, um, you know, the, it's changed so much. I mean, my reflexive answer to the, to the question dating back to my days in Chicago, which go back more than 30 years, um, to the answer of, is it safe to take a bag of food? Is it safe to take help when you desperate need, desperately need help? For most of my career, the decades that I've been doing immigrants' rights and immigrant service work, the answer was take the help that you need because it won't be held against you. And you, we can't advise people that anymore because we're at the moment we're living under a government which, in, which wants to use it against you, which is looking for every possible lever that they can to use against immigrants. And so, you know, we used to be fighting against caution in the immigrant community, which was overblown and overstated. And unfortunately, it's, it, you know, people are, are scared for a reason. They're, they're, their government, this government is out to get them. Um, and, and the harm that that causes is immense it, and goes well beyond immigrant communities and especially at a time like this one where where you know pandemic is obviously doesn't observe borders and doesn't respect you know different kinds of people with different kinds of immigration status you know i've worked in government what government's job is supposed to be about it, it, the, like the core course requirement is you're supposed to keep human beings safe um, and in order to do that, you need to provide access at least to the basics with respect to public health and safety. Mm -hmm. And when we fail to do that, we're not just hurting the immigrant community, we are hurting everybody by making immigrants and immigrant families more vulnerable in the way that Fernando described earlier in the presentation. That's not just bad for them, although that's enough, is bad for everybody. Um, but unfortunately, the, the caution that people are living with, the fear that they're living with, is, is they're not making it up. You know, it's well-founded, unfortunately. And that's, I think, maybe the biggest change I've seen in my, you know, way too long doing this. I'm wondering, um, Nicole um, and Karina, can either of you share more about how you're seeing these policies play out in communities? Um, you know, what are you, how have they, how have people responded differently? Um, you know, how is it making, um, how is it really changing what you're seeing in your work? It's changing what we're seeing in every aspect of how business as usual was. Um, so in, in order to, to gain trust and um, have a relationship with a community um, it, it really is fundamentally based on trust. And when that trust, because of the, the raids or because of the deportations or because of the confusion, when that fundamental trust, not because we as an organization have done anything wrong, but because now they're distrustful and fearful, um, there, it makes that outreach effort, it makes the know your rights efforts. It makes everything about the work that we do extra. And while those of us in this profession know that our work will be very hard and it will require numerous um, outreach efforts and almost re-explanation of what was um, a truth or an obvious because things were changing so rapidly. Um, it, for us as Instituto, uh, we've been a beacon of hope for 43 years in the community established um, on the premise that every immigrant and their families um, have the, the fundamental uh, right to reach their fullest potential. And we do that through education, training, and employment. And what we have found um, most difficult in the last four years is this, this educational component to regain that trust. Um, it is the numerous ways in which we have to say almost the, the um, that yes, DACA, you can apply for unemployment. Um, yes, um, you are allowed this fundamental right to education. Um, simple things that one would imagine are logical, but in this illogical, chaotic, confusing time, uh, we have to spend a bit more effort. The other 
complication that we're facing now is that because of the extreme financial hardship that our community and our participants are facing, things like a citizenship fee is a barrier. Things like a very small, um, um, what one would consider a, uh, an insignificant expense is a very uh, much a barrier. So from gas cards to CTA, um, uh, paying for transportation, uh, childcare, those things that always are barriers now are insurmountable barriers that one must address if the, the goal is to continue those services whether remotely, which is um, part of what our new reality is, right? If we are going to continue down the, the ability to connect with our participants, we have to do so remotely. So that's another set of barriers, right? You're talking about um, addressing access issues, internet issues. Do our participants have smartphones so that we're able to, to continue the process and um, for, those of us in the education um, arena, we have two high schools, we have a small college, and we have careers to pathways. All of that was a quick shift to a remote learning environment, which you can't begin to do if there's no access to internet. There aren't sufficient devices for every learner in the family, right? We're not asking the right questions. We need to be asking, do you, as a student have your own personal device. When you ask to have a computer at home, the answer will be yes, but that's not going to solve the problem when you have six or seven individuals within a household that also need to learn. So I think that part of what we're relearning and, and pivoting at Instituto is to ask the right questions so that we're able to address the barriers um, and that those barriers that might have existed before that probably they could get by a week or so that now they're they're larger and they're with a, with a, a more frequent cadence of need. Um, and as we begin to address the, uh, the digital divide, it is a deeper question that we have to ask, right? It's not just that there's some free internet for certain individuals, it's not free. Um, and that, that fear that Fernando and Fred and everyone has talked about is real. So folks are afraid of getting the free internet. They feel that that might violate um, their opportunity for permanent citizenship because of the public charge. So it's that education component. So it's a, it's a um, multitude of um, barriers that we're facing with in this new um, COVID times. And uh, I'd like to pause there. Yeah, I'm curious to hear, Karina, um, what, what would you like to see, like what would you be your suggestions to foundations and other nonprofits for engaging people in more effective ways now, given all these really challenging new barriers? I really appreciate that question, Megan. I think that the foundations have done a tremendous um, amount of effort in, in, in listening and understanding how they can help. I really want to put it back to the the need for the community is so large and those individuals whose boots on the ground have already been working with communities and have established that trust really have to be that warm handoff, that face that gives the service. Um, for example, if there is um, additional barriers, a link or a sign up or a registration process that is not part of the organization that interfaces regularly, it just won't work. Even if it's go to this link, sign up for a free computer, um, it's going to be a barrier. We've seen it. When we announce Instituto is providing free laptops for its participants, we'll have a line out the door. But when it's you need to go to this link and fill out a, an application process to be entered into a lottery and they'll advise you, they won't follow up. So I think it's continued support for the community organizations that are working with immigrants and refugees to continue the good work by supporting those relationships to continue so that they can be the bridge into the community to provide the services. That's going to be a significant um, uh, increase in access to those services, whether it's internet, laptops, whether it's um, benefits, um, and the 
opportunities to distribute food and basic necessities through those community organizations is really the, the intersection of opportunity and where you can funnel that, that uh, commitment and, and uh, funds. Um, Nicole, I'm curious about what you've seen um, with, thank you so much, Karina. Um, what have you seen with the, um, with the people that you're working with? Sure. Um, and I, I think what I want to do in my response to that question is highlight and kind of underscore all of the expertise that has been shared already through all of the panelists and also even recognizing a lot of the expertise that are showing up through the comments mm -hmm. and um, focus my response to the mental health impact. Mm -hmm. um, so you're hearing a lot about, you know, fear and systems and how that's increasing barriers to accessing and reaching out to all of these um, places of support that are limiting, are much more limited now. But, um, you know, I want to take us back to um, when this current administration, excuse me, current administration went into place in Chicago, um, immediately following the executive orders and the travel ban, there were five suicides in Chicago within the immigrant population that first weekend, purely due to the fears that this next four years were going to um, bring upon this community. And since then, there have been increased numbers of immigrant and refugee folks calling up hotlines and seeking out mental health services with coupled with this experience of distrust and fear. And so what that has resulted in, I specifically work and direct a child um, trauma center. And so the youth that we see are six to 21 years of age. And when we're talking about what does this mean for families, we're talking about children and parents who are afraid to leave each other's side, who are afraid to go to the grocery store out of fear that we're going to be picked up on the streets, our kids are going to be taken from us. Um, these kids who are now going to school being worried that when they go home, their parents are no longer going to be there. So if we're talking about education and learning, we're now talking about kids who have difficulties focusing in class, who might not be completing homework, who already have limited English speaking proficiency, who are then going to be targeted by teachers for behavioral problems or um, academic difficulties in ways that are already um, biased and unjust. And so then what ends up happening is youth get identified, if we're lucky, um, and referred to some places of support. But what ends up happening once they come to a space like my center, um, although our focus and our kind of eligibility is um, a six to a uh, 21 year old who's experienced trauma in their home country during migration or part of resettlement, what we are seeing is youth who have experienced horrific traumas at various points in their life and ongoing. But what ends up happening now is instead of talking about the migration story or the torture that happened in their home country, we're now talking about the systems that are torturing them here in the US. And so it's, you know, my legal case has now been brought out, you know, from one year into three and four years. And how am I going to continue to navigate this? And I'm terrified day by day. And so trauma focused treatment is around survival. And it's no longer around how do I, you know, typically it's around integration and how do you heal past experiences, but this is so chronic and ongoing. It's what do we do now to help build that trust that we're all talking about, how to give experiences of future orientation and hone the resiliency within the communities. And it's really about community. All of these individuals and families have an incredible amount of strength, but it's how do we come together to do that? And so it's trying to build a lot of these bridges. I think one of the things that I've seen within Chicago is coalitions across the city really becoming strengthened and multidisciplinary in order to band together to um, work against some of these policies that are being put in place. Thank you. Nissa. I'm curious if you want to uh, share from um, some of the reporting that you guys are doing at Borderless Magazine and um, what you're seeing um, and if there's anything that particularly that stands out to you in this discussion. Uh yeah, I guess a couple of things. Bordos Magazine, we were founded shortly after the Muslim travel ban in 2017. So, you know, our his story, our, our coverage has, you know, started from, from that um, initial policy and gone on. And it's just been, there's always some, some immigration story in the news. So it is a time when I think a lot of people who are not immigrants are paying attention to immigration in a way that we haven't seen before, which is great. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of like misperceptions going on. And um, I, I think, you know, as, uh, as an outlet, like I really appreciate what Fred said about resilience and resistance, because there is 
so much to be fearful and sad about. And, you know, especially at this moment, you know, the stories that Nancy shared um, and what we're hearing in our own reporting of the challenges and really sorrows that people are facing now. But in, in the midst of all that darkness, there is so much uh, reason to hope and so much reason, um, you know, that people are building new, new tomorrows right now and really like building on, on, the po on a policy level what, what the next steps are. And I really appreciate, you know, like you can check out um, ICER's work in this and that some of the campaigns they're doing. Other groups around Chicago are doing a lot of work around um, impacting the immigration court and detention system. So there's a lot of resilience and resistance amid all this fear and sadness. And, you know, that's what we try to focus on at Borderless Magazine. Um, but I think people really need to remember that, that this isn't just a, a one note story. I want to make sure to open it up um, to um, questions from the audience. Um, one of the questions that I've seen in the chat um, is about how this is impacting um, suburban immigrant communities. I think, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about over the last few years is that we kind of our discussion has really for the last few decades really focused on the city in Chicago and we haven't often recognized that a lot of um, lower income people have actually moved outside of the city as that's gotten more exp gotten more expensive. I saw a statistic recently that um, like 50% of um, the low income people in Chicago are actually living in the suburbs. Um, and it may, I think it was over 50%. Um, I'm curious if anybody has anything they can share about what's currently happening in suburban communities. Um, and feel free to start putting questions, more questions in the chat for those of you who have other questions to share. Well, I, I can start. Um, quite a number of um, quite a number of organizations within ICR's membership um, are organizations that serve this, the suburban communities, and uh, obviously, there's been a you know a great shifting of immigrant communities out from the city uh, to the point where many immigrants are now settling directly in the suburbs um, because of you know social networks and uh, employment opportunities and available housing for that matter uh, out in those communities um, yet um, as these as these communities emerge um, there's not always the same kind of infrastructure um, you know you know certainly not not the same range of organizations like instituto or or the same kinds of uh, community community organizing projects uh, that you see in the city, um, and much of the challenge that ICRR has been trying to trying to respond to is how do we build up that capacity in the suburbs? Whether it's uh, working with existing organizations or even helping helping people in the community um, create their new, create their own organizations, um, you know it. You know, life in the suburbs, um, given lack of trans, lack of public transportation, um, and just sheer distances, is difficult. Um, but um, but you know, that said, you know, I can think of, you know, at least a couple of organizations that are stepping up. Um, one of one in particular is the Southwest Suburban Immigration Project um, in Bolingbrook, um, which you know is led by. Uh, actually, a, 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 a couple of immigrant youth, youth leaders, um, they're not so young anymore, but, uh, um, you know, you know, it's, it, you know, these are, these are younger people who, you know, came up through the community and, uh, and, you know, have de dedicated their lives and careers to, uh, you know, empowering immigrants uh, in the southwest suburbs. Um, and, you know, they, you know, SSIP is one of the organizations, as I mentioned previously, that's created a mutual aid fund um, to, um, you know, assist uh, uh, immigrants in need um, in places like Bolingbrook and Romeoville and Joliet. Um, uh, so, so you know, while you know, while while immigrant communities may be may be hurting out there, um, you know, at, at least there's some you know there, there you know there's some glimmers of you know organizing and and uh, mutual assistance that have also emerged. Does anyone else have anything to share on this question, or we can move on to Mary's question? Okay, Mary had a great question, um, which I also have, um, which is what can I tell people who think immigrants need to wait in line or just come here 
quote unquote, legally? What would you say to um, those people? That the immigration um, system is broken. We were so close so many years ago to comprehensive immigration reform. And that when you look at the face of an immigrant, um, I think we have to, to share those stories. And I, and Fred's heard my story previously, but we have to courageously tell our stories. So if someone like me, who came from Mexico um, back in the early 70s, can become an attorney and um, contribute to democracy and all that's great about America, um, and have been a undocumented child, if more of our stories can come out um, and that show that what could be possible can be possible, we have more faith in um, the immigrant success stories and the ways that we can contribute. Um, for us, it was the, the ability to adjust status through um, the anchor baby laws that existed at the time. My brother was a US citizen born in the fields of Salinas, California, and we were able to adjust. So I think it's hearing the stories of those of us who are very similar to the stories that you heard um, from Ida Cire and Fernando's stories, right? The, the good that could come out of um, really defining that pathway towards citizenship is so critically um, important now more than ever. I think that's a really good point. I'm also curious, um, just from Pre Fred and, and others, um, my sense is that, you know, historically there were many, many more, you know, in, in previous years, we've, al we've allowed many, many more immigrants to come. Can you say a little bit about how that's changed? Are we like, for example, compared to the seventies or compared to, you know, the 1920s, how, has the um, number of immigrants we're allowing into our country changed over time? Okay, well, I'll try to start on that. Um, so, um, you know, we, we go through phases in this country's history, um, you know, I, and I meant to mention this earlier, um, but, uh, you, know, you know, in the first hundred years of our country's history, we pretty much let, it, let everybody in. Um, you know, just anybody who could afford the, the ticket to get on the ship uh, to come over uh, was, was able to come in. Um, and, you know, we started uh, a wave of restrictions in the 1880s, initially targeted against the Chinese, um, but then extending to Southern and Eastern Europeans and most, most of the rest of the world. Um, and then you know, in the in, in the 1960s, uh, even though we broadened, even though we eliminated the immigration quotas, we also in you know uh, imposed a overall ceilings on the Western Hemisphere on Latin America. So what had been a largely legal, um, you know, you know flow of uh, flow of people coming up from Latin America overnight became illegal or restricted, uh, and that. You know, you know, one of the consequences of that was a large undocumented population that uh, was partially fixed in the in the eighty six amnesty, uh, but you know, the, you know, you know, the the underlying conditions have not changed. Um, so, um, so the numbers have fluctuated, um, and uh, you know, uh, though you know now with this administration, those numbers have plummeted. Um, you know, for any number of different reasons, whether it's, you know, well, all the reasons that uh, Cecilia laid out, you know, cutbacks in refugee resettlement, cutbacks in asylum processing, um, public charge, um, you know, you know, you know, tougher, tougher, um, tougher scrutiny of of, uh, of uh, visa applications, and now now the country bans um, that's that have been imposed, and now and now the sixty day so called temporary uh, suspension. So um, you know, uh, you know, we you know we we go we go back and forth, and uh, hopefully when this is all done, we'll go back to a time when we are more welcoming. Um, I want to pose last, one last question for anyone on the panel who wants to answer, and then we'll switch over to the breakout rooms where people get a chance to talk a little bit more um, in depth about, um, you know, what they'd like to see. Um, if we were to really see equity for immigrant and refugee populations in Chicago, what would that look like? What would we have to do differently as a nonprofit and foundation community? What would be some of the first things you would like to see change?
Big question, I know. <laughs> so I think one of Nancy's very um, important points that was made earlier is um, just really making the information available in the country's origin language so that that um, language barrier is addressed and removed. So critically important to have information that is um, that someone can understand, right? And that sometimes includes um, preliterate um, pamphlets of information. Um, I know that my father was less than a third grade education when he came to this country and one, one of the smartest men ever. Mm -hmm. However, we have to meet individuals where they're at and relay information in a way that they can understand. Mm -hmm. That's great. Anyone else want to add? All right, well then we can go to the next slide. Um, we're gonna break up into breakout groups and you're gonna be assigned, um, and thank you to everyone who um, posted questions. We're sorry that we weren't able to get to all the questions, but we will certainly try to follow up with you um, individually. Um, so uh, if there was a specific question for a specific panelist. Um, we're gonna break up into breakout groups and we'll just um, probably spend about 10 minutes um, just letting people chat together. Um, and we have some specific questions. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so what we really felt like it would be useful to do is really talk about what can we do better? So what's an example of something you've seen that's not gone well? So what's something that maybe a nonprofit or foundation has gotten wrong when working with new Americans or immigrant and refugee populations? Um, and what else could we be doing? What are um, either things that you've seen that you'd like to see more of, um, or what's something you haven't seen that you would really like to see more of? Um, and if you like, you can also share if there's something that you would like to do differently in your work or in your um, um, life um, after following this um, conversation. So um, we um, will, um, we're gonna go ahead and break up into breakout groups. You will be invited into a breakout group and then you can say yes. Um, I see there's one more question um, in, the, um, in the chat and we will follow up on that with an email. So, um, and then we'll come back um, and Cecilia will wrap us up. And if there's anything that people really want specifically wanna share from their breakouts, we'll open that up to share. So you should be receiving a breakout invitation shortly. go ahead and actually turn it over to Cecilia to um, to wrap us up and then I will um, just make a quick note after that about future events. Great so I should start just by thanking everybody for participating in this. This is sort of a new era and being able to have you know a virtual event rather than the in-person event we were hoping to have. Um, it's really really heartening to see this kind of participation and actually the depth of the discussion which I found incredibly useful and I'm hope, I hope that others found incredibly useful too. I'll just say um, you know from the breakout session um, and from the general conversation we have a lot of work to do and um, I'm incredibly grateful that for how vibrant the Chicago community is, how many folks from foundations are part of this conversation, as well as folks from NGOs who are doing really heroic work in this time. Um, I just, I wanna um, echo what's been said, what Karina said in particular really eloquently, like that folks in the community um, are showing extraordinary courage in telling their own stories. And that makes all the difference in the world in making visible what sometimes the rest of the country doesn't see. And that um, even if the COVID-19 crisis hadn't happened, the, there really isn't anything that we described today, which wasn't already affecting this community really hard. And obviously a crisis like this makes it all um, even more difficult. So that's when the kind of infrastructure represented by the institutions and the leaders that are on this call really, really matters. And the um, inclination to make sure that we are gathering as much information as possible from like the real source, which is the you know, families and the individuals and the organizations which are, are, which are working day and night to serve them um, is really essential if we're gonna get the response right. One theme that came out of my breakout session is that we don't always have the best tools to reach people when, when they are 
able to be reached. We heard line, uh, stories about lines outside of NGO doors before seven in the morning so that people can get served and people be having to be turned away because there, you know, there's so much need in their capacity issues at NGOs. We heard about from um, even government organizations recognizing that if they're putting information on websites, um, that that may not reach people who don't have broadband access. Um, and so one of the challenges that I think uh, we particularly need to work on is figuring out how to reach people who need us the most in a way that will actually get to them. And I know that's something that Megan is working on with a number of her colleagues there in Chicago. Um, so, I, so I guess just my concluding remark is to say thank you. This is, um, these are the times that really show us for who we are as a society. Um, they really reveal the ways in which we have failed each other as a society. And since we're seeing a little bit of America at its worst, we're also seeing a lot of America at its best. Um, and that um, includes some of the stories that we've heard today. And it absolutely includes the folks who are, you know, doing the work under these really difficult circumstances. So much gratitude to all of you for participating. Um, Megan, much gratitude to you for pulling this all together. Um, and, you know, hopefully these are conversations that we can continue because this, um, this work is tremendously, tremendously important. So with that, back to you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so just want to let people know that we will continue to have other um, events um, in the future. So please keep an eye on the New America Chicago page for future events. Um, thank you for everyone for your participation. I'm sorry we didn't get to share more about what was in the breakout groups, but if you ha would like to share something um, interesting or unique from your um, breakout group, please, please, please email it to me. I would love to hear about it. Um, and we um, look forward to continuing this conversation. Um, we are, one last note, we are currently um, working on a project to help um, more people in Chicago access their stimulus checks, particularly the people that we've been, you know, it won't be it won't be accessible to many of the people that we've been talking about today but for people who don't have um webs they don't have web access or they don't have um ids and addresses if you have ideas um for that please also email me about that because we are developing strategies right now to reach um those people that are need it most and are going to be it's going to be the hardest for them to um access it 